Hello and welcome to Behind the Bearcat. This is the podcast where the Northwest Missouri State University Career Services Office chats with Northwest faculty, staff, students, alumni, and friends to hear about their career journeys, how they got to where they are, and how they became Bearcats. I'm Career Services Assistant Director Travis Klein. And I'm Hannah Christian, the Director of Career Services here at Northwest. And today's guest on our show is... I'm Bronson Herr. I'm assistant professor in political science. Uh, yeah. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome, Bronson. It's great to have you here today. So hey, assistant... it's good to be here. Yeah. Go ahead, oh. Anna. Sorry. Oh, I was just, you go ahead, Travis. Okay. So I was just going to say assistant professor in political science. So what kinds of classes are you teaching here at Northwest? Yeah. So uh, I was hired to specifically focus on policy and, and the administrative state. So I teach everything from like government budgeting uh, to policy and analysis, um, uh, the policy process, um, and then, uh, you know, classes all in between. Uh, I also teach the methods courses here for poli-sci, so how to use statistics and and understanding political phenomena. So So I, I guess my question is, how does one become... A political science professor. Could you t- talk me through that journey? Yeah, I would love to. So I did my undergraduate work at Brigham Young University in Idaho. And um, I started off thinking I'd be a, a lawyer. And I think a lot of folks that go into poli sci think I'm going to be a lawyer because uh, that seems to be the practical thing to do. And uh, my mom was like, okay, like I'm a first generation college student. So she was like, okay, so what are you going to do? And I was like, I don't know, something like maybe music. And she was like, no, no, do something practical. So I was like, well, I'll do poli sci. And she's like, I don't know what that is either. Something practical like business. And I said, well, I think that's how you become a lawyer. And she is okay with that. So, so that started my journey. Uh, but it turns out that political science isn't just becoming a lawyer. It's studying politics. It's studying uh, the system, but also human behavior. And I just... I found that all so fascinating. Um, And so eventually I dropped the idea of becoming a lawyer, although still a great path, uh, and decided to to further explore studying uh, politics. And uh, that led to my graduate work and then eventually uh, becoming a professor. So, okay. So did you know as an undergrad, when you kind of jettisoned this idea of going to law school, I mean, that's another form of you know, a higher degree. What was mm-hmm. your thought process around? Did you get a master's degree or what doctoral work? Like, how did you make those decisions? Yeah, mentorship was really key here. So, as a first generation college student, um, when so, so kind of what pushed me into uh, leaving the law path is uh, I got connected in this network of individuals and they were like oh uh, within this network we have a bunch of like fancy lawyers and so you should talk to them if you want to go to a law school and I, I said that's great and so I don't want this to uh, scare anyone from going to law school but but I went to these really big fancy lawyers in in, in Boston I'm from Massachusetts and um because uh they were making it in some of the top law firms in the country uh they they were telling me how difficult it was and how little they saw their families and I thought if this is what lawyers do I don't want to do that well that, that's like the really high end folks you can do a lot of thing with law uh, things with law that will will uh, make it so you don't have to work 80 hours a week um, but that scared me enough that I was like well I'm not going to do that so uh, I had a professor previously approach me and and say hey do you read the textbook and I said Yes, because I thought everyone read the textbook. And uh, he's like, I can tell like you're reading and, and you're engaging with this work. If that's the kind of mindset you have, you should go to graduate school. And I said, well, I'm not thinking about law school. And he said, oh, okay. Then he came back to me and he said, I hear that you're not going to law school. You should go to grad school. I said, well, uh, I think I'm going to be go to seminary and become a religion teacher. And he was like, okay, power to you, I guess. And that was the, that was the, the next step. And then I didn't do that either, uh, long story short. And so I went back to this professor because he he was, you know, the one who would always reach out to me. And I said, I, I don't know anything about grad school, but I was feeling really lost. I was engaged uh, and when these other things didn't work out. And so I was feeling all this pressure to uh, uh, 
say that I had had a life path, uh, especially for my poor father-in-law who was very patient. Uh, but uh, and so I went and talked to this professor, and he explained what graduate school was, um, and and he recommended. He said, you know, just um, uh, uh, I'm trying to say this in a modest way. He was just like, you know, you seem to like, so I wasn't a great high school student. So I leveled up in college. And so he was like, you know, I think you could do a dual master's PhD program. I think you could handle it. And so I um, just went straight into a PhD program and happened to get a master's along the way. And, um, and but, but it was, you... all that was because Matt Miles, my professor, Dr. Miles uh, showed me all these avenues, told me how to apply and, and guided me through that process. How did you choose which program you you accepted and went into? Yeah, so I I I sat down in Dr. Miles' office and we went through some of the the, the programs, uh, the big programs, um, and we we did the whole stretch school, uh, fallback school, and then mid tier schools. I won't name any names uh, of of how we organized those. Um, but we also, when you when you go to graduate school, it's really important who your um, who your committee is. Your dissertation committee makes is is a big deal. You become an apprentice to whoever your dissertation chair is, and so we we did it with an eye towards who is going to be my 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 dissertation chair. And even if I got there and, and that changed, um, that you know that's possible. Uh, so at every school I applied. I had in mind, I'm going to have Juliana Pochenko in, in Indiana be my chair. I'm going to have Hader Merkel at KU be my chair. And uh, and so we applied. And then to be honest, uh, when when the acceptances and non-acceptances came in, I uh, ended up taking the one that offered me the best scholarship, most money. And and I went to the University of Kansas and Dr. Hader Merkel became my uh, dissertation chair. So. That, that's actually a super good point that I, anybody who wants to go to graduate school that I try to get them to understand is that when you go to undergrad, it the school is what matters, right? Yeah. Like I, yep. you, you go to a big school, you go to a little, you know, the school is what gives you the experience. When you go to graduate school, you become like a part of this lineage and the school, it might matter a little bit, but it's the actual people that you're working under in your discipline that really determine your course, your trajectory of your, your career after that, making that, sure that you're a good match, that research is right where you want to be. That's the big deal. That's absolutely right. And, 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 and I know career service people like to talk about network, but a part of that is because of the network that you get put in. Um, you're, you're this student of someone who's a student of someone and um, and so you know, I, I'm a student of Dr. Hader Merkel, uh, who who's a, a a big deal in political science. People know who that is, uh, but he's a student of uh, of Myers, um, who was at Texas A&M, but then got some kind of like endowed professorship somewhere, uh, and uh, and he's you know uh, a a giant, you know so well known, especially in public administration that um, and so you're connected to all that into that network. Uh, and so that becomes really important. You could go to a lesser uh, ranked school, but have a, a chair who's a big deal at that university and still uh, in the wash be better off than maybe someone who went to a better school, but uh, is attached to a no-name professor. Now that some no-name professors got to get there, build that mm -hmm. network. So, so not that you want to brush them off, but it's funny how many times when we talk to faculty, we hear that story of they didn't start out wanting to teach or to be a professor, but somebody, one of their professors saw mm -hmm. something in them. They took them under their wing. They kind of mentored them and kind of loved them into higher education. It's funny that we've heard that time and again, as we've talked to professors from different disciplines, how, you know, someone identified something in them that kind of ignited their fire to teach. And that's just, that's a really cool thing that I don't think people who are outside of academia, you know, have heard about. So it's really cool that that happens. Have you had a chance to have any students that you've kind of been like, Hey, have you thought about grad school? You could do this too. I did. I have a, a student and I, I don't know if I should mention names or not, but uh, who uh, got a, a great scholarship. I, 
a full ride to K-State, um, which, you know, being a KU guy. Yeah, that's a bit of a rivalry. I, I have to I forgive that a little bit, but <laughs> I, I tried to get her to go to KU, but uh, she wanted to go to K-State for valid reasons. And, and uh, but yeah, and, and she's doing great. And that uh, was my first experience kind of what what in my mind I've come to call doing the Matt thing, what Matt did for me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that was a big deal. I, I went home and talked to my wife about it and and everybody I know, I was like, I, I did it. I finally got someone to, uh, do what I did kind of what, what, what went, what happened for me. And I was the only one in that. Uh, and, and obviously that student did 98% of the work. Uh, but, it's fun to be a part of that journey. Yeah, that's really cool. So, so can you talk to us about you? You kind of mentioned, you know, you you grew up in in you know the East Coast. You went to school, you know, at, at Brigham Young. You went to to K State. How did you get to Northwest? What was it? How did you find Maryville, Missouri? Out of all of those places that you could have went. So networking again. Uh, Dr. Campbell is uh, the what we call political theorist, which is like philosophy meets political science um, in our discipline uh, here on campus and um click the link above if you want to watch his interview look mm -hmm. travis look i the, just did the little like like and subscribe thing that there you go you. he was actually telling me <laughs> earlier today that he was on the podcast he's like oh it's such a good time so, so that was good to talk about uh, anyways he's also a ku guy uh, actually, I moved into his office. So the semester he left was my first semester. I moved into his office and uh, and you know found some remnants of of this this person who used to be there. And I was like, "Who's this guy, Luke? Whose office I now have?" And so that was kind of a funny thing. Um, but when he was here, uh, when he got here to Northwest, um, probably in 2015 is when he must have gotten here. Um, he helped to put on. A, a regional conference uh, here. And as a graduate student, I was at a point where I wanted to start looking at going to conferences. I went to a conference in my undergrad with, with Dr. Miles um, uh, to present undergraduate research, uh, which was really helpful in getting scholarships to go to graduate school, by the way. Um, but uh, um, I was looking to go to these conferences and I thought I would start off, start off with like a smaller conference before I went to one of the bigger national ones uh, to show some research and to get used to that. And so I thought, wow, that small regional conference in a place called Maryville, I mean, it's only two hours from KU. So I convinced a buddy to come up with me and the two of us did the conference. And, uh, and then I was like, well, this is fun. So I came back the year after. It was also held in in Maryville. That conference is no longer held here, uh, but uh, it was a really good opportunity for me to meet some regional professors. Uh, and I always wanted to go to a, a student based, well, a uh, teaching based university. I, I like research; it's fun, uh, but I really get a kick out of teaching. And so uh, I met all these these teachers um, and several who our professors here at Northwest. So then when I applied, they knew who I was. I knew who they were. Um, I mentioned, Hey, I wouldn't mind helping with that conference. That's something that was a big deal to them when I applied. And, and so they happened to be like, Oh my gosh, this is great. Uh, they had seen my research. They knew I could do that. Um, and so, so it, it looked out really well because I competed against because Dr. Hader McKell knows so many people. I knew who I was, who also applied to this job because they all talked to each other mm -hmm. and uh, all the all the big wigs. So they they were all you know I knew uh, that I was going against someone from the University of Florida, which is is ranked higher than KU. Um, but I mean, just them knowing me, uh, me being a known entity, I think that makes a makes makes a big difference. So, I, I want to I'm add, a, <laughs> add an exclamation point to all those things you said, especially regarding when you go to present your work, it, it is it is about presenting your work, but it is also about making those connections with the people. It's about getting your face in front of someone else who can then they feel more familiar with you. They've seen you, they know your presentation style and you had nothing to gain at all from presenting at a conference, right? So like you, you are not presenting in front of them for a job. 
you were not presenting in front of them for some big high pressure, high stakes thing. You just showed up to present your research, your, you know, not looking for anything or asking for anything in return. And that gets, I wish every undergraduate student could understand if you want to go on, you need to do, you need to have an undergraduate research sort of experience like that so that you yes. have that experience in that conference mm -hmm. style presentation um, way and how and how awesome of you to be able to go with your mentor basically to the conference because it's it's hard to know from the outset nobody te there's no class here called let's go to an academic conference and learn how to work it right like nobody right. teaches that class um and so to be I'd able take to it do if somebody that did. is a skill I would too. <laughs> Travis we're going to add that we were going to create a course <laughs> called here's how you go to a conference as long as that's amazing <laughs> it is and and it was kind of funny so uh back to to Dr. Miles uh, I call him Matt now. It's so weird because mm -hmm. for a long time it was Dr. Miles, but now it's Matt. So um, Matt's like, yeah, like, you know, if you are serious about grad school now, we're looking at some places, you should go to a conference and and so you can put that in your resume. And I, I was like, okay, let's do that. And so he's like, you know, you're going to have to work on a project outside of class. And, you know, I'm um, at the time engaged uh, at the time have a full load of classes and you know i'm after my school work i'm i'm working on this paper um and and i remember he's like write an abstract i had no idea so like i wrote this six page thing and he's like uh, an abstract is a paragraph and i was like oh yeah yeah i probably should have known that uh, as a junior or senior in poli sci so you know we modified it and um uh, but yeah, it was so valuable um, to get to know people in the field and, and to get that experience and then to put that on your resume to say, hey, look, I'm I'm already doing what graduate students do as an undergrad um, at a maybe uh, not at the same level, but I'm doing the same work. So like I can obviously do graduate work. So that was a big deal. And that, I think, is one of the big things that led to to scholarships and things. So you mentioned, I think a lot of people, when they think of political science and they think of like what you do with that, they think about, you know, maybe being a lobbyist or being a campaign manager or a legislative aide. But you mentioned you teach like the statistics side of poli sci and some of those things. So what are some of the outside of the things that those immediately come to work, you know, working for candidates and working for political, you know, groups? What are some of the other things poli sci students can do with that degree when they get done if they don't choose to go to grad school? Yeah. So what I tell students is that anything in the private sector that that you need to run that you need the same thing on the public sector mm -hmm. and to be honest even more uh because um mm, there's this perception that there's more money in the private sector and, and that c can be the case uh but man there's nothing like the benefits of of the public sector uh federal uh federal benefits are super nice mm -hmm. um and you can make money in the public sector and so uh really the sky's the limit uh, though I'll point out a couple of things as uh, uh, city managers, like on the administrative side, city planning uh, is a great avenue. I I teach a public policy course, right? I teach students how to do policy analysis. Uh, so if you want to go work for the EPA and do some environmental scans, environmental analysis, uh, that's a great outlet or public health analysis or any, any area uh, they need folks to do that that kind of analyzing uh, but they also need uh, folks who can um, promote things uh, they need calm people they need all these these types of things now the statistics side uh, is trying to explain or predict um, political phenomenon using statistical models and, and all statistical models are a simplification of reality uh, that's what math is although it doesn't always seem simple and uh and there are a lot of organizations including like facebook social media organizations um yes campaigns uh but local governments that are interested in, in that kind of work think tanks which are like um non-profit academic -y kind of uh, organizations that aren't universities um interest groups they they all want that ability um to be able to try to understand the world through through statistics, so it's it's definitely a uh, a marketable skill. Talk to me about teaching. 
What do you love about it? You know, like if you were to ask me, are you a creative person? For a long time, I would have said no. Like, I don't really care about creativity, which is awful, I guess. But but actually, I'm really a creative person, I think. And and that manifests in like, and how can I construct a way of presenting information? To me, that's such a, a creative process. And it, so I go in it, and it's also kind of like a stand-up process. So in case you don't know, for students that are, might be listening, like the persona that you create as an educator is like kind of important, right? Um, mm-hmm. Because for me, I'm actually a, a kind of a shy introvert person. And so I have to uh, like work myself up to get ready to, to present and then, you know, kind of create this like almost persona uh, in order to teach. Um, not that you're fake, but it's almost like how a stand up uh, or a politician, well, maybe I won't say politician because then it'll be like <laughs> fake, but uh, it's like how a stand up like, works in material uh, in, a, in a certain way um, to create kind of like an adventure or persona. And the same thing is true with education. You have this material, um, but we all have more material than than a student could possibly sit down and absorb. And so we have to cre- create uh, these ways of disseminating that information uh, and also take students on a journey where it's not static, but there's high points and low points and there's a little bit of joking around but then some seriousness um and i really enjoy that endeavor and and i like to tweak it to make it better uh every semester i had someone describe it to me once as being a professor is like being a preacher but instead of the bible it's your textbook in your pulpit your lectern and you really you can do that in a lot of different ways and there's different strategies but once you find the thing that works for you it's very much that same kind of idea of you know you have kind of the text, which is the the baseline for everything, but then you're adding your own interpretation. You're trying to play on their feelings. You're trying to make them feel for it what you do. And it is kind of almost, there's a, a good parallel. So it's funny you mentioned almost going it's to seminary. It's a great parallel. Yeah. Because yep, you're kind right. of doing that. Political science is the is the, the higher it's power the topic. that you're preaching now. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of overlap. So, um you i can't remember if it was last fall or the fall before that because years go by and i don't even know what year it is but you had a pbl intern correct Mm -hmm. oh yes yeah i did so um can you talk a little bit about uh your process behind that project and maybe how that pbl intern helped you out yeah i would love to so uh we in, in poli sci, my second, I think it was my second year here, might have been my first actually. Um, uh, the university was interested in creating new initiatives um, uh, that they could put some funding behind that that would uh, create new opportunities for students and for the university. And so we were all supposed to come and pitch some kind of idea of what that could be. And uh, and being a new faculty member, I, I was like, well, okay, I'll just pitch this thought that I have and it was of, of uh, some kind of policy center that we can do like hands-on policy work uh, through that center um, and that evolved with the help of my uh, fellow political science professors and our chair at the time Dr. Gilly into uh, a civic engagement center policy center that goes hand in hand and, um, and, and the thought process was to take uh, a a project every year or every semester, depending on, on how much time we ended up having, and and to turn that into like a, a career ready day one type experience for students that they they could choose to opt in. Again, I, I think of it um, like back with my experience with with Matt that some of the best things that you put on your resume when you're a college student is things that you do outside beyond the classroom, and uh, and so. I, for those who want to engage in something like that, I wanted to do that, uh, and, and we have uh, we we do we've done uh, exit polls. We're looking at maybe doing a grant project uh, this semester that that still is a little bit on on the um, uh, making it happen side. So I won't go into too much detail there, but and uh, and so we've been trying to do these projects to get students engaged, and especially for the exit poll. Uh, to allow a student to put their own ideas. So uh, I got a PBL intern uh, and they uh, uh, were interested in 
um, doing some some research, maybe creating a research uh, paper. Uh, they're interested in going to law school, uh, which, okay, it's fine, uh, but still thought that writing a research paper would be helpful because it is quantitative um, analysis in law school is becoming more and more of a thing. And so, uh, and so we did, we, we, uh, uh, that student created uh, a large portion of the survey that we administered to the community. Um, uh, they got paid some money to do this work and to build their resume, which is great, uh, but then also to create something um, that that then could be passed on as our center to the a, another student to the next student uh, to maybe not have to do as much of the late work to to get some of these things off the ground uh, the way that this student ended up having to do a little bit of the extra late work. So. Yeah, the first so one's always that, the hardest. You set it, it the all first up. one's always that's right. It's always the hardest. And uh, for me too, because because I have to like figure out, oh, I made this mistake, mm -hmm. you know. So next time I won't do that with the student. And so uh, the first one's always um a bit of the guinea pig, but there's also some some benefit to that. So uh so yeah, oh, it was such a good experience uh for the the two of us and, and we found some interesting uh things by uh, surveying folks here just in Maryville, Missouri. You mentioned putting things on your resume that you do outside of class and that aren't just work experience, right? Because I imagine that mm -hmm. designing a survey, you know, actually going out and polling people. I mean, that's a whole different, like literally walking up to people at the, the, the outside, the voting areas and asking them, Hey, can you fill out my survey? Like that takes a whole different skill set. And sure does. Um, those types of, those types of things that are in between, I would call them in between, right. They're not purely academic. They're not purely a work experience. They're really a, a very well meshed kind of hybrid of the two. Um, those are really amazing to have on your on your resume. Could you maybe share what other experiences could be valuable for a student? Maybe in political science specifically, maybe not. So I'm I'm big into interns uh, and internships. And so uh, when I was uh, an undergrad, um, I went to my internship director and I said, you know, what kind of internships do you have? Uh, and he was like, well, you know, we don't really have any. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and he's like, you know, just find something and then pitch it to me. And I was like, oh, okay. So what I ended up doing is I called all these local governments all around the university uh, where I was at in Idaho. And I, I was calling all these local governments. I was like, hey, do you just need someone who will like for free help you do geographic information systems? Because I, I did some coursework in that. or Or city planning and all these folks were like no they, they were really small rural communities and uh, they're like no we we don't want that we wouldn't know what to do with an intern and um and so it, it was kind of funny i ended up getting two internships that that following semester uh one i reached out to a um interest group and was like hey i would be interested in just providing free labor and uh, they came back at me and were like, actually, we need a chief, chief of staff. And I was like, excuse me, <laughs> what? how am I qualified to be chief of staff of this nonprofit? That's like crazy talk. And they're like, well, our chief of staff just left, left and we have folks who have experience, but none of them on the politics side. And, mm -hmm. and that's where we need our chief of staff to be is to like go down to Boise where, uh, yeah, down to Boise from where I was and, and, and lobby. And, um, what do you think? Can you do it? And my brain was saying no, but my mouth was saying, yeah, I can figure out how to do that. And so I met with this, uh, uh, bank ex exec who, who was the funder and we worked out a strategy and I, I try to use my political knowledge the best that I could to, um, generate policy that I that I wrote based off of policy in Montana that we then went and snuck snuck into offices uh, at the state capitol and and try to corner representatives and get them to listen to us and we had some mild success doing that and so that was a great experience and then the other internship so I had already signed on to to become chief of staff and I was already freaking out about that when one of these local 
uh, communities reached out back to me, one of these local governments, and this guy, uh, Mr. Bingham, I'll never forget him. He he was um, he had retired. The local communities like we need a city pl- uh, planner. Would you just come back like part time and do this? And I had called them earlier, and he was like, I I wouldn't know what to do with an intern and. And he called me back and he's like, right, did you say you would work for free? And I said, yeah, yeah, I just, I need some experience. He's like, wow, well, heck, I'll find something for you to do. And I was like, well, I already have an internship now. And he's like, well, I'll just do two. And so I was like, okay, I'll just do two. And so I did, so I did two internships that semester. And then I, I, I didn't have a full course load that, that semester. Luckily it was my last one. And, um, and so I had a couple of classes, I think on top of that. And, uh, and that was a great experience too, because I got some good city planning uh, experience under my belt. Uh, we were trying to bring a potato factory to this town, uh, and and it turned out that people wanted jobs, but not a stinky potato factory. So it didn't really work <laughs> out for us. We got kind of chased out of town a little bit, um, but but man, oh, that was such a good experience to be chased out of town. So, uh, and I share some of those experiences in my class from mm-hmm. both those. Uh, internship opportunities. I love that. People always think that, uh, oh, sorry, Travis. I was 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 the internship guy and people come in and they're like, what kind of internship do you have? And it's like, what did you find? Like, (laughs) right. You tell me what you got an offer for and I'll try and help you make it happen. So I think they expect like we have a Rolodex just full of jobs and they're like, oh, what's your major? Okay, here, here's a local government internship that's just always there. Yeah. Take some hustle. Yeah, it, it, it definitely does. does. And it's yeah. it, the funny thing to me is you mentioned two things like that one for sure happens all the time where students come in and do that. But then also the the folks that you reached out to like saying, I don't know if I'm qualified to supervise an intern. It's like you are like you have a job you've supervised. And that's literally all it is. I think that a lot of times that name freaks people out and they think, well, I've got to have some kind of you know, academic bona fides, or I have to be certified or some kind of, and it's like, no, it's just a job. It's just like any other part-time employee. It's an experience you're giving somebody. So it doesn't matter what your job is, you're qual. you can be qualified to show somebody how to do the job you do. So. So true. Sorry. I I was going to say, no, no, you're good. I was just going to say, go back to that connection between what you're learning in the classroom in terms of like policy. So what, theoretically do you have to do to bring a potato factory to a town right and then the actual work that happens afterward or the execution you know like being able to bring a potato factory to a town is not is not a simple thing right so nope, you gotta you change kind of under- zoning laws we, we <laughs> had a petition to change zoning laws which we did accomplish we just didn't get the potato factory yeah so there was a lot of of just different things that you learn and, along and the way sometimes so to emphasize i guess going into an internship and thinking you're going to have this like top of the mountain experience is like an extremely simplified version of like i'm going to make an a in a class or something <laughs> like that right and so you didn't get the potato factory did you fail no like a lot of like reality is like half changes or half measures or like twists and turns. And, you know, we've been trying to, uh, I hope someone from this area is listening. We've been trying to get this front counter um, fixed in our office, right? I'm going to use the higher ed example here, but I put this into capital improvements because it's got to be a capital improvement it can't, we can't just walk in with a sledgehammer and take it out. Right. Like doesn't work that way. I've been tempted. I've done this for the last six years, put this into capital improvements, even though we're going to pay for it. And they're like, nap, nap, nap. And then you're like, what do I write? Like in the classroom, in academia, you're like, this is the 16 ways to get your policy approved. Right. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. you like walk through them in the real world. And you're like, man, this is not anything like what I learned in the classroom. So like, it just like, I wish the students could understand that if you don't like the subject, that doesn't mean you won't like the work. Mm-hmm. If you don't like the work, mm. that doesn't mean you don't like the subject, right? Like the disciplines and the work are not the same thing. That's right. And and I think you're at your best when you can you can take an academic and a particular practitioner's perspective and blend those approaches because both um, answer different types of questions and give you different types of skill sets. Um, but, but, but the folks that do the very best are lifelong learners of their, of their craft 
as well as lifelong practitioners. Mm -hmm. And so both components are really important. Yeah, that's like I, a mic drop. That's a mic drop quote right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I spend a lot of time talking to students who have either going to do internships or who have done internships, and there are no failures. You may, you may not like the experience. You may discover that's not the industry you want to go into, mm -hmm. but that's it's a lesson. There are no failures. There's just it's like like in your work life as you know as an adult, like there are, you have setbacks, you have things that you learn, but there really aren't failures. Like you know, it's very hard to completely fail. It can happen, but it's it's rare. So in right. an intern, it's like the whole thing is, did you learn something? Then mission accomplished. That's the whole point. So you went, you got some experience, either it was good or bad, but it's experience either way, and you learned something. So as long as that's you're learning, right. that's... the world turns and it's fine. That's a very valuable lesson, Travis. That's Absolutely. Good. So yeah. what so what advice would you have for students maybe who want to do political science or who maybe who want to go to law school since that was a path you were on at some time? Any kind of sage-like wisdom that you would share with students? My say's wisdom for law school is to talk to our law school advisor, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mary Liz, uh, Dr. Leonard Casperger, uh, Ken Casper Leonard, sorry. Uh, she'll be able to help you. That's my sage wisdom there. I like have like thoughts, but they're not tested. Um, political science, getting involved in political science. Well, so the difference between a political scientist and like someone who just is like a political pundit or interested in politics is like the, the scientific approach we take to understanding our field. And so we're applying the scientific method to social phenomenon, which is po uh, politics. So if you're interested in politics in any way, just build on that, like what I say, the non-political science stuff, and then bring that into political science. And then we will take all that raw material and we'll work together to refine that into scientific thinking. And uh, and if you're interested in doing that without like a professor, that's fine. There's a lot of great books out there. There's a lot of free, especially to college students, free uh, academic articles, which I know sounds maybe boring to say it that way. But think of it as like uh, little like lampposts of knowledge that you can that you can like uh, try to replicate. So we'll give you like frameworks and ways of thinking that 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 you can then apply um, some of either this practitioner knowledge that you may have, or just maybe this love of politics that you may have. Um, and a lot of because I teach like intro to American government, I teach a lot of students who don't like politics, find it too divisive, which to be honest, sometimes I do as well. And so, um, but then by the end of the class, they're like, well, I guess it it's not all about the divisiveness or it's not all just about these um these political figures like no there's there's this richness here of understanding philosophy or or policy or statistics to uh um, create something to create greater understanding absolutely as a grad student someone who's in a grad program right now thank goodness for those free academic articles like i would not survive if those didn't exist <laughs> amen so that's one of the best there. parts about staying with the university is you still mm -hmm. have access to all those things <laughs> absolutely excellent well thank you so much we appreciate your time yeah this was a lot of fun i appreciate it too and uh i'm sure soon not just from this podcast but from from everything that you have to offer i'm sure that they're they're learning a lot and so thank you for that service all right well that will do it for another episode of behind the bearcat and we will talk to you next time hey guys we hope you enjoyed that episode if you did be sure to give us a thumbs up below that helps out also if you've not done so yet be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss a new episode also we'd love to connect with you on social media you can find behind the bearcat on twitter instagram and linkedin Plus, the audio podcast comes out on Fridays on all the major podcast platforms. Thanks again for watching Behind the Bearcat, and as always, we'll talk to you next time.